Uh, my name is Jeff Law. Um, I work for Red Hat. I've been working on GCC for, uh, I don't know, 25, 30 years. I lose track at some point. I'm getting old. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, some process and procedure improvements. Um, I very much get the sense uh, when, when I interact with developers as a whole that uh, there's friction in our, in our development process. It's not working the way we would like it to work. Um, so I'd like to talk about uh, some, of the, some of the changes that I think we can and should be making. Um, and ideally, when we're done here, I'd like to come out of this with essentially three to five changes that we can make that will improve everybody's development experience here um, and allow the project to move forward. Um, so <laughs> some of you actually remember my time in the management team. So I know smart goals. Um, and, and essentially, I, I, wanna, I want us to pick things that we can actually do. So you know, the Git conversion, we can do that. Um, building an AS system automatically fix bugs, probably not going to get there. So again, when we come out of this, let's make sure we're looking at things that we can actually achieve in a reasonable amount of time. So for those of you who, who were not around, um, if we go back uh, to the, the first 10 years of GCC development, um, work was primarily gated on, on one to two key developers. If you, if you had a patch you're trying to get in, you had to get their attention, you had to get their time, uh, otherwise you couldn't move forward. Um, so obviously it made the ability to move patches forward a, an incredibly painful process. Um, in addition, uh, our C++ front end, our Fortran front end, and our test suite was out of tree. And so every time we t did a release, we had to go talk to the C++ guys. Does this still work? Uh, oh, no, it doesn't? Well, we can't move forward now. Um, similar for, for uh, G77 at the time. Um, and from a high-level standpoint, there was really no developer autonomy. You did not have the ability just to make a change that was right and, and clearly an improvement. Um, it was a closed process. Um, I was just talking to folks in the hallway. You know, if you, if you want to look about, try to understand why a patch was done before 1997, you can't, unless you talk to me. I have archives. But the, there was no public archives of what we did or why. Um, and often, even though there are, you know, I do have an archive of it, um, patches just went in without any discussion at all. So you couldn't understand the motivation behind a lot of what went in the tree. Um, snapshots were private, and there was essentially no exposure until the release was made. Um, and <laughs> version control was Emacs. Um, and for those of you who have used that as version control, that doesn't really count. Um, circa 97, uh, we found that process to be so incredibly painful that we actually forked GCC. Um, and, and the goal was to distribute act responsibility across a wider set of maintainers um, with the goal of being a faster overall turnaround time for, for developers and to make sure none of the maintainers got overloaded. Um, we wanted to leverage component integration uh, that would allow us to do high quality releases more frequently. Um, releases that, at pre-EGCS had gotten to the point, I think it went four years without a release at one point. And, and so it is very discouraging as a developer to write code and just When's it going to be released? Nobody knows. Um, we wanted to bring in the, the G++ front end, bring in the G77 front end, so that as we did development, we always made sure they were always working. We brought in the test suite to make sure that there was a level of consistency in what we were building into our system, that it, it worked on a consistent basis. Um, and this was actually one of the things that was the most valuable. Let's get all our discussions out in the public list. And as somebody who does archaeology on GCC, this was the most useful thing we ever did. Because if something happened after 1997, I can go back to the list, I can see the patch, I can see the discussion, I can see you know, somebody objected to this, or somebody was worried about that, and we didn't, you know, maybe it didn't get tackled because we thought, oh, that can never happen. Oh, it, it's happening in 2007 or 2017. Um, so I can go back and, and do that kind of archaeology. Um, and we wanted to avoid corporate overdue corporate influence and, over, and, and undo corporate control. So that's what we're trying to achieve in 97. Um, over the last 20 years, um, we certainly want to continue this, this distribution of maintainership responsibilities. Have we succeeded? Yeah, not so sure. Um, and, and in theory, if you had a component that didn't have a maintainer, it went away. Are we good at that? I don't think so. Um, where are we doing good? We have strong regression testing policies now. If you, if you uh, want to submit a patch, you have to do a bootstrap, you have to do a regression test. 
quality of our compiler has increased dramatically because of that. We have a reversion policy. We don't always use it, but it's there if we need it. Um, we have got a culture now where if you're fixing a bug, you add a test. And so we don't see the same bugs appearing. That's not to say we don't have regressions, but we don't see the same bugs coming back. Um, and we're doing better at our future testing. And finally, we have a, a well-understood release schedule. They happen every year, and they've happened like clockwork for I don't know how long. Um, Jakob's in the audience can probably tell me. Um, no? <laughs> so, after looking at brief history, where are we today? Um, it seems like, and I was, I was actually really pleasantly surprised, but every cauldron that I've been to, the steering committee discussion is, how do we get more maintainers? Um, how, do, how do we make patches move forward faster? Uh, so clearly, we're still not hitting all the goals we wanted. Um, and particularly over the last few years, the contribution process seems like it's getting more and more painful. Slow patch turnaround times leading to developer frustration. Um, and I'm seeing, not only in my, in myself, but in other people who have told me, um, I'm looking at a suboptimal solution because it's in a space that I don't have to go get review. And this was the same pattern we saw in, in the first 10 years of GCC. And that is a red flag. Something is not working anymore. Um, I personally am questioning the value of the way we do reviews. We have a, a, a really good set of developers, but yet we're nitpicking on patch review. That to me is crazy. You take a guy like Richard Sandiford. He's been working with GCC for 20 something years. And, and I'm, not, I'm not picking on Richard. It's a, he is an example of something that I, that I see regularly. He's been working on GCC for 20 years. If he checks in a patch, I know he's gonna be around. If something's wrong, he's gonna fix it. Um, so really the only question for, for Richard Sanford I, I really wanna ask is, is what you're doing something we want? Okay, you're done. You don't have to ask me any more questions. You can just go forward and commit your changes. That's where I wanna be. Um, and, and in the general, that, that's a symptom that the review uh, responsibilities have become way too concentrated. Um, Richie, myself, Jakob, um, that is not, that does not scale. And it's essentially taking us back to where we were 20 something years ago. That's not a good place to be. I, I don't wanna go and have the pain of another fork. Those who were involved know how painful it was. It's all encompassing. You do not ever want to fork a big project. Our processing tooling is dated. We're still using 80s technology, email and patch review. Um, SVN. <laughs> um, thankfully, I think we've made progress this morning. <laughs> it's, it's taken what, you know, how, how long we've been working on this, on a trans, on trans uh, moving to JIT, to get? Four years, five years, six years? <laughs> Um, I think that's actually a symptom that as a project, we don't have a good way of making project level decisions. Who green lights the transition to Git? Quite frankly, it's, it's this group here. Um, and my, my suspicion, so right now we have a six month development window and a six month stabilization window. That seems horribly out of whack. Why should it take us after six months of development, six months to stabilize the compiler again? That's just crazy. Um, so my, my sense is that needs to change. I don't know what the balance should look like. I don't think it's that. So in, in my opinion, and this is strictly my opinion, um, it's time to start reevaluating policies, procedures, tools with the goal of reducing friction. Um, and, and the first thing is we should be trusting the domain experts. Again, to come back to the, the Richard Sanford example, I implicitly trust Richard Sanford. I know him, I've worked with him for 20 years. He should not be getting patch reviews for things that we know we wanna do. Um, but there are others, you know, they, they, again, I'm, I'm using Richard Sanford as an example because I just did a, you know, 12 series kit from him. Um, <laughs> and it, it was like the third one in two weeks. <coughs> um, we should be, in, you know, obviously we want solid, good contributions, but they don't have to be perfect the day they go in. They have to stand on their own. They have to be a clear improvement. They, they can't break anything. <laughs> but, but the final form, I think we can and should be iterating towards it. Are there corner cases that we don't handle? Okay, fine, let's, let's, attack, that sec let's attack that later. 
If we can get a, 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 a patch that is isolated, does something very, very good, and yet does it solve every problem? No. Let's, let's tackle the, the, those other problems as, as follow-ups. <sighs> Changing the way we focus review. So again, I'm coming back to the Richard Santa, for example. Um, we, we should be matching the depth of review to the developer. Richard Sandiford, is this something we want? Go. Somebody comes to me and says, uh, that we've never heard of, and says, I've rewritten the register allocator. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Um, <laughs> I, I think you, we're gonna go a little deeper into that one. <laughs> but, but, and, and it, excuse me? Um, I'm not sure what you're saying, Tom. Barrett did, <laughs> many, many years ago, and, and it, was like, it, it was a great design, um, and that's why I use that example. Um, he, he did a, probably the single biggest change to reload in 97. Out of the blue, never heard of him. Um, the point being is, is that's a continuum. Somebody comes in, changes something that we never heard of, and he's changing a major part of the compiler, we probably want to do. Is it something we want? Is, it the, design, is the design good? Is the implementation good? Is he handling the major cases? Are there nits? You know, essentially top to bottom. Whereas somebody who's been around the project for many years, you know, maybe we, we go, is this, is this a feature we want? Are there design questions? And say, that's good enough. Because it's somebody we trust. If they break it, they're gonna be around. <coughs> um, and I think we need to be using better tools to make this whole process easier. Um, as somebody who reviews patches all the time, um, I don't find that this process that we're using today is actually working. There's nobody in this room that can say they understand all the GCC. And I would say there's nobody in this room that can say they understand all the SSA optimizers. It's, it's impossible. It's just too big. Um, so one of the first things that came to my mind is uh, the GLIPC project um, essentially rebooted itself about uh, five years ago, give or take, Carlos? More than that. Um, and and they, they've got a consensus model, which says here is how you build consensus around a patch, a significant patch, and, and this is how you go forward with it. Um, I think there's a lot we can learn from that. You guys have um, outlined policies and procedures for what you can check in that doesn't require any review. Right now, our policy in GCC is it has to be obvious. What does that mean? <laughs> Um, and, and, and I've talked to people, and the, you, get, you get a very wide spectrum of what obvious means. It was obvious to me. <laughs> Is it obvious to somebody else? Maybe not. Um, so I, I think we need to look at those documents that you, that you guys have produced in the GLIPC project and say, how can we adapt this to, to a GCC world in a way that allows us, the, the GCC world to move forward faster? Um, and again, extending more trust to our regular co contributors, guys that are doing this stuff every day and it, for years that they shouldn't have to wait for Richie, myself, Jakob, Richard Sandiford to act a patch that, quite frankly, they understand better than we do. Um, and again, does the patch stand on its own as an improvement and can we iterate to final form? Let me scroll down because again, I cannot use presentation mode. All right, so uh, this whole slide is now no longer needed. <laughs> we are gonna move to Git. Um, <laughs> let's see, what, is there anything on here I, we didn't talk about this morning? Um, what? What about it? Are you still going to count this as, a, as one of your goals to achieve during this boff? I think we have to. We, we've agreed to do it, we've, but we haven't agreed. Is it the mirror? Is it Maxim's conversion tool? Is it Eric's? <laughs> so, I don't, so we have consensus, yes, we're moving. But how does that actually happen? Who owns building those commit hooks? What we voted for is we are going to move no matter how. Yes. That, that's what you asked for. And yes. that's what we're going to do, I hope. Come hell or high water, we're moving. <laughs> uh, so the one, the one concern 
But one concern I would have about it is how much of the history of Git do we, in the Git tree, do we need to preserve? Do we need to preserve from all the way from the 80s? Do we need to preserve from the 1990s? Um, like that's the only real concern is how much of the Git history is useful for us. That's the one discussion we should probably have. So l let me repeat the question back because I'm not sure if I heard it right. Yeah. Is your question how much history do we need to preserve? Yeah. Okay. Um, so again, as somebody who does archaeology every day, the existing mirror, I've never had to use anything else. <laughs> Ever. Um, and, and in fact, what I have found is that, you know, finding the, 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 the change in Git, I can always find it. Um, but what turns out to be more important is going back and finding the archive discussion on the mailing list. The patch itself sometimes is interesting, but what really is most important is finding the, the old discussion. Um, so I think, you know, if, if, if you guys said, we're moving to the mirror today, I'd say, yeah, that, that works for me. I could go today. I have not used SVN in years. I, I could not tell you the last time I used SVN. I use CVS for the web pages, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> um, and and, uh, and I, I strongly believe that getting to a, to a place where we're using Git every day is going to change our workflows, um, and, and I think it should. And, and I'm, I'm probably my sense is is that this is going to be kind of unsettling. You know, we, we've been doing patches for 30 years via email. And I don't, think I, I don't think that's the right model anymore. Um, I think pull requests. I think tying it into testing systems. And, and those who are staying for later, I do have a talk on, on, on testing system that I built. Um, I think we should be using branches very aggressively. I think we should be doing uh, cherry picking off those branches, which probably also means we have to drop the way we do change logs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and, and I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, I read change logs, but I don't think we need to be committing change logs as a separate file. Um, anyway, uh, now do, Git can, uh, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble and get really fast. So I do think we are gonna need some guardrails around it. And we talked a little bit about this, about this morning, I'm sure we will work that out. Um, but I, I do think that Git is gonna allow us to do some things that, that we've been unable to do in the past. So, change logs. <laughs> Whoever was clapping, they, 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 they should go away or, or we need to do something else. We certainly need to do something else. Yeah. Oh, yes, question. I'll deal with converting the website from CBS to Git. I got a working conversion done during the last talk and I believe I know what I need to do to get the hooks working for the website in Git. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'll also try and figure out what we can do about the messed up CVS to SVM branch points in whatever Git conversion we use. Since that's the main th place where in archaeology I find there are problems in both SVN and Git. They so, are. And, and some of the branch points are completely wrong. Yeah, but you know what? Find better heuristics to fix them. We don't typically need the branch points. Every once in a while, if you want to do a, you know, a, a diff back to the branch point, but just, I just don't find them useful. I think they're useful because once you know when the branch point is, that helps find things on the mailing list for when it was branched. Well, yeah, that's, what, that's the only reason I go and find patches, so I can figure out what day I got checked in. Yeah, so I think that's why branch points are useful. You oh. have to know where the proper branch point is. And, that, and if we can... you, that helps you find things on the mailing list that are relevant. <laughs> helps find, did something happen before or after this stuff branched? And so, on. <laughs> so I think branch points are useful and are the deficiency in the conversion for CVS. And as long as you don't use the existing mirror unchanged, it is easy with whatever tool, if you know what the correct branch point is, to fix a branch point as part of converting. So if you can fix them in the conversion, yes. awesome. I have some ideas about appropriate, hu appropriate heuristics to use as well. Okay. One obvious heuristic is use the old branch point tags. But that doesn't actually really work because CVS to SVN messed up where it copied tags from in the same way as it messed up copying branches. <laughs> um, so question. Um, if we were to move to one of our Git, you know, one of the Git repositories out there, can we do any of that after we've moved and fix it, fix the merge points retroactively, or does that re is is that one of those Git things that gets you in trouble? Well, if you change that, that, that will change all the commit IDs on the branch. On that branch. I think we probably ought to have just one point where we rewrite things and change commit IDs, rather than have multiple points where we do that sort of thing. All right, so... And then if we find things are messed up after that, that means that we'll leave them being messed up until whatever comes after Git. Okay, so... 
<laughs> hopefully nothing, or at least hopefully I'm retired by then. Um, so Joseph, my worry with doing that for all the branch points is how many are there and can we get them all converted? And, and do we want to just do a subset? Is it release branches plus things that people care about? Well, in practice, if we've got some sort of script that finds a corrected branch point, it can practically run over all the branches there were up to 2005. Works for me. So I'm not sure there's any real gain in omitting some branches. My assumption is whatever conversion we use, we keep all the branches except for any we specifically decide this has weird messed up history. So we're going to get rid of it like we did from a couple of branches in the CVS to SVN conversion. Works for me. Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with that and hopefully everybody else is. So please keep working on those scripts so we can get the, the, the branch points set. And uh, hopefully we do it one time and never have to go back. Hopefully the website conversion should be somewhat sooner than that, given, given how much simpler it is. Like, uh, the turnaround time for me converting the website is about one second. <laughs> the website's a little bit smaller. <laughs> um, Jeff, can yes. I... Uh, Joan, right at the back here. Oh. Uh, can I, at the risk of sounding like a dinosaur, just caution you on the change logs side? Um, I've been through many projects who have made the correct analysis that having change logs as separate files is not a good idea, and have dropped change logs, and have then dropped all the content of change logs from their commit messages, and their commit messages, which should be the substitute for change logs, have been inadequate. And it would be brilliant if GCC could be the first project to get rid of change logs, but not get rid of all the good stuff that change logs bring with you. Uh, I'm, fine, I'm fine if you go first. In the GNC um, context. Tooling. If we do this, I want a tool that verifies we have bloody change logs in our commit messages. <laughs> In the GLibc context, we've decided that we need to review people's patch submissions, not just the patch, but the text of what will be the commit message mm -hmm. to make sure that includes the required information. Yes, yes. We also believe in GLibc that we don't want the change log format. The problem is not so much the file, it's the format, and in particular, needing to list what changed at the level of specific named entities within specific files. Right. We did manage to get RMS to agree that you could avoid doing that, provided you have a sufficiently accurate script for listing the entities. Works. Indeed, ultimately, as long as the script accurately listed what the entities changed were, you wouldn't need also to know exactly what changed, have the description of what changed within each entity. You could have the overall description from a commit and an automatically generated list of entities that goes in the automatically generated change log. Cool. Where's Fidesz? He's around somewhere. <laughs> okay, so the script is already there. Uh, I think it's, it's been, I'd done it back in March and then I dropped the ball on that. And we should probably pick up that discussion again. I was trying to piggyback on one of the discussions that Carlos started last month, but I had no responses to that. So maybe we should, we should have that conversation again and close that once and for all so that we can get rid of change logs in some form or the other uh, for 2.31, I think yes. it is now. But we so have to review full commits. Yes. So that once, yeah, yes. yeah. So once we have something like GitLab or Fabricator or something like that, we can we can actually have that baked into the workflow, and it's 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 a lot easier to do it that way than to do it over email, because I'm pretty sure over email there's there's not that much of a rigorous uh, review of the commit message because it's just an email in the end, exactly. and nobody really looks beyond that. What Yeah. Works for me. So even though I, I read change logs, I will live with whatever you guys want to do that meets the requirements that the FSF has. And it sounds like you guys have already been negotiating with Stallman. Yeah.
Cool. A, f a, f a very important thing about uh, reviewing things on uh, uh, reviewing uh, uh, patches patches in e email is that we keep a history of it. We know what was said in the in the reviews, and uh, if we are going to lose that, we are going to lose a lot. So we should whatever tool we check, uh, we choose, we should make sure that uh, uh, not only uh, is it recorded, but it's also easy to find and to read. Yeah. But I would actually argue that having a patch review system would probably preserve that sort of history a lot more accurately because then, then you know what the patch is, what the comments were, and then where it went in, into, into the repository. So I think we're solving that problem in a much better way by moving to a more yes, modern yes, tool. Yes. I, I think ultimately all you want is to be able to get back to it. And it, whatever is the easiest way to get there. Well, you want to be able to get back to it. You also want to be able to say, go through your backlog. And the backlog may include patches that have been reviewed, but where you might have other comments and so on, without having to deal with some awful, awful infinite scrolling web page that will not be a good way when you have 5,000 patches and comments that you want to go through. So I think if you have a system with tracking, the added tracking will be very useful. But I think it should be something that integrates with email at least as well as Bugzilla. So it sends things to a list in yes. a meaningful form, sensibly formatted plain text emails and so on. Even if you need to go to the web page to close something and say, to close something or to submit something or whatever. I think you want to have things go to the list as well. I think that's fine. Sensible format. So actually quoting the relevant context, recalling one of the experiments people did some years ago that sent pretty unreadable emails to GCC <laughs> patches. Yes. <laughs> but we could certainly do with some better system for actually tracking what needs review. Mm -hmm. Yes. So right now what needs reviewed is my, is my inbox. <laughs> that, yes, that's probably not good. <laughs> yes. No, I've, got, I've got a list of patches with reference to the easy LMM numbers on GCC patches so I can find them in future. This is something I should look at if someone else hasn't already reviewed it. But then if I want to know has someone else reviewed it, I need to start looking through the thread and see was there a subsequent review. Yep, and, and I think the first step there is we make our get conversion, and then we start using some of these other systems. The way we're doing it right now is just crazy. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. So Carlos's mention was that 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 other thing is the pull request, and that you can re-kick off CI uh, as a result of a pull request. Not loud enough. I'm not loud enough. Um, yeah, I am also worried about email uh, losing email. So, I, like Sadesh, I agree with you, but I also disagree in the sense that, like, Kernel in theory has scaled their workflows by paralyzing out reviewers into like these grouped hierarchies, and so Kernel seems to. I mean, you can decide on your own if it's a functional or dysfunctional review process, but it does. Email does scale and it allows for a bunch of different workflows, but the PRs would allow us to hang really more complex, uh, both post-commit checking, pre-commit checking, uh, and, you know, and, and other kinds of commit things to make reviewers' lives easier, so that when you go and you say, well, how many PRs do I have? And then you can see, did they all pass their pre-commit CIs, or how are the build bots doing today? Are they all green, or other things like that? But I am worried that the systems in place today, which in, when I'm looking at them as GitLab, produces awful email stuff. And so I need to find out whether or not we can change that drastically with plugins or not. I think it's very interesting to look at the discussions on the same topic that the kernel community is having around now. Well, because yeah, they're looking at possible tools, maybe new tools. The point being, they don't generally want these cent centralized web-based systems where you need to click on, a web to click on a web page for everything. So what systems they come up with that might sensibly allow incrementally moving from an email-based system to something with better tracking? Maybe some sort of distributed system. May well be interesting things to look at for us since. Although 
we're working on a smaller scale than the kernel and we're working with central repositories where the kernel has its different system with a great many repositories. It is still similar issues. We're having scaling issues with an email-based system. How can you move on while still allowing people to do their work while offline and have offline copies of everything and so forth? Yep, absolutely. And, and the ability to work offline, I, I don't need as much as I used to, but there was a time when if I couldn't work offline and do patch review, that would have been disastrous. There are some things where, if anything, we're doing better than the kernel in some things like having bug trackers, which right. the kernel has rather than But, but I, think, I think the point of at least looking at what other projects are doing is a valid one. There's no reason we can't learn from, from the kernel guys. Well, we're not perfect. Yeah. I was going to say, gnome the entire project switched to GitLab. Right? Like they just said, we need better workflows, or otherwise GNOME's not going to be able to release. And they have a lot of sub-projects. Yep. And the GitLab workflow let them integrate a whole bunch of stuff with that. So one of the things that we talked about earlier was we need newer uh, students coming in and working on GCC or GNU toolchain. All these kids, school kids, are working in GitHub. They're used to pull requests. They're used to that workflow. If we need to be relevant in five or ten years' time, we've got to figure out that middle ground between email and these pull requests. So if it means some holy cows need to be slayed, they may well need to be slayed by us as a community. Agreed. And, and giving an example of, of, of the kernel community and how, how it uses email effectively is, well, it's valid, but uh, there's also the other factor where it's not like the kernel community is happy with the email system. It's something that they have to live with because there is currently no patch review system that can scale to that level. And if, if we actually get to a point where we have a patch review system that scales to that level, I'm pretty sure the kernel community will move to something like that. So um, if, w at the risk of stating the obvious, why can't we just integrate the ability to respond to a point in a patch by email with the same ability to respond by clicking on a button on a web page. You know. Yeah. It's possible, but it, it ends it, up generating HTML email, which can, which can irritate certain developers that are there today. Uh, and I I, don't, and I'd be one of them. <laughs> it doesn't seem to have worked out really that well with Fabricator. Basically, everybody's gone onto the web page for LLVM. I think David had one. Yeah, yes, I strongly object to Romana's comment. I think that the statement that we previously made with the switch to C++, and I don't think it was wrong to switch to C++. I think there are a lot of benefits. But there was an argument that the reason that we don't have more developers is because we're in this old language and people, all these young kids want to program in C++. That was part of the argument. And that didn't make any frickin' change. And so to make this change that, oh, if we just go to GitHub, we just do pull requests, it'll get people more interested, that's BS. There are plenty of good reasons. I'm not saying not to move to GitHub, I'm not saying, but don't, we should not delude ourselves that any of these sorts of things is the reason that we don't have younger developers. So I really strongly object to that sort of train of thought. It's fine to move to C++, I don't object to it. It's fine to move to GitHub, fine to move to pull requests, but to just keep saying, oh, this is the one magic thing, and I'm if we did this, this is why we aren't relevant. That's BS. Okay, I I'll agree with that. <laughs> but I would also say, David, that we don't actually do C++. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeff, just the uh, interruption just for a sec. Uh, Go. I can't follow up David's comment because it's way above my head. However, I'll talk about uh, uh, patch review and comments and linking them to pull requests and linking them to Bugzilla. To, I think if we start small and just don't get too crazy uh, ambitious, if we can have simple hooks in the email stream, in the Git stream for private branches and in Bugzilla, that they share and, and, and inject links to each other as, 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 as branches are mentioned, as pull requests are mentioned, as bugs are, are mentioned, as, and codes gets committed, as long as we get all those links mechanically added to the respective uh, communication streams, I think we can make it... Uh, That'd be a pretty good progress. Well, and, and we, we, we can support both workflows for whoever needs it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would like to object with uh, the argument uh, from Sir there. 
I am from the first generation in my school who just never touched SVN, and the only thing right now that prevents me to come to projects like the, the uh, GCC uh, compiler is because I don't understand anything, and it, it would take a, me a long time to just take it to be uh, used to SVN or anything uh, that is currently used. I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand a lot. My hearing is not very good. Can, can you repeat that? Um, the the only thing that right now prevents me from coming uh, into big projects like these, like G the compared, GCC compiler and all these uh, kinds of nice things I would like to to uh, be engaged in, is because they have uh, obsolete, uh, not obsolete, but old as like th old uh, v VCS uh, thing like SVNs and. It would take lo me a long time to get used to them, and that prevents me to come to try to uh, engage in these uh, projects. Yes, our, our tools and our processes and procedures are a high, are a very high bar. Oh. <laughs> um, regarding the Linux kernel and why email actually works for them. I think that using email or pull request is only one part of the full story because they actually use both. I mean, if you contribute a patch to the kernel, then you send an email to one of the, to the corresponding mailing list, let's say BPF or the network subsystem, for example. Then the maintainers of that subsystem, they are monitoring that list. Then they get your patch. Then if they accept it, then it is up to them to actually integrate them into a pull request and then do the pull request to the upper uh, maintainer in the hierarchy because they do have a hierarchy. Yeah, we don't have the hierarchy. And, right. and that may be something we want to add. Well, but in that case, uh, the debate should not be between email or pull requests. The, the debate should be about what a maintainer is and what are the responsibilities of a maintainer. Because right now, for example, the full, uh, now it is left to the contributor, for example, the integration of the patch. Mm -hmm. And the maintainer doesn't assume any kind of responsibility in that sense about the integration of the stuff. Yep. The kernel maintainers, they actually do that. I think that's why they are grumpy all the time, you know? But, <laughs> and, but uh, they, they actually do that. So in my opinion, if we want to move to a similar model, then we will have to rethink about things about maintainers themselves. Ye not Very just the tooling or, or the mechanisms. Uh, oh, and I agree with David, by the way, <laughs> regarding, uh, you know, Python, C++, and we will have millions of new developers. I don't think but the pull not requests as used merge. by the Linux kernel we are not have that much to in common thing. with pull still We have two conversations going, hold on. <laughs> we are still moving My hearing is bad enough, I can't understand two. <laughs> we still use the same process as before, which is you get instead of SVN. And it's still a linear history and everything, and it's only fast forwards. So, uh, so people can still commit their own stuff. We are not changing that. Maybe we should change that sometime, but that's not what we're doing now. Uh, so, so we're using Git, but we're not using all of the features of Git. But it makes it does make it a much easier uh, for people to use Git locally uh, for the, for their development. Uh, and, they, and you use the same thing to commit, right? And that, uh, that, that, that actually gives one of the uh, important uh, things that Git brings us. Uh, people can send smaller patches, divide it up into smaller pieces. Oh, that yes. helps a lot. That makes review a lot easier. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I don't think pull requests used by the kernel have much in common with pull requests we're talking about. So the thing is there are basically two different versions. There's the git request pull, email sent requesting pulling from some random repository. And then there's pull requests in some online system that provides tracking of requests and comments on it and so on. And we're talking about having some tracking system, hopefully one that integrates with email well enough, that where it's people can submit it as a pull request using whatever tool, but it would be that sort of system with tracking rather than the sort that's being used by the Linux kernel with git request pull. I think you're right. Um, I, I think w where I would like this to go is 
the, the initial submission goes into a testing system before I ever see it, before Richie ever sees it. We'll talk about that in about an hour. <laughs> Jakob, because uh, I'm going to get Jakob a mic. <laughs> so talking right, about here we go. <laughs> talking about this slide, uh, I just want to yeah ask how far are we from from these tools? Because uh, do we have a tool that is able actually to extract from the patches uh, the entities which which we are actually modifying? Yeah. We have right now we have the make lock in in GCC three, but that's not going doing good enough job even for writing the templates because. It does things like if you change the function comment before a function, it, it marks it as, as something yeah, changed so in another one, uh, defining macros and defining, changing prototypes of functions just does you, weird You things. will see, right? Like, I, like I, I said, we'll change glibc before we change GCC. And then you will get to use, you can borrow the same tool we have, and if we need to make improvements, well, we can. But, but for, you, you will we do have it the tool. for C, and we need it for yeah. C++. Yeah. So I, let's, let's take yeah. this one level higher. Your question yeah. was, how much of this is ready? None of it. The whole point here is to figure out what we want to work on. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to get out of it. <laughs> what are we going to do? Because uh, first, I can't write all this. Um, I, I just don't have the time. But we, uh, what I want to get at this is we as a committee, what are the few things that we want to take away from this meeting and say, let's go make this happen? And some of it, I probably can. I just can't, I can't do it all. Let's pick, let's pick a couple of things and go with them. Um, yeah, uh, I agree. It's, it's, it's nice. both, both things are nice, even if, if you write just templates and, and fill it in and, and maybe decide the change log goes into the commit message instead of file. That's, that's fine for me. Uh, but for instance, for the formatting checker, uh, well, uh, when we were using uh, C, mm -hmm. it was clear and then was actually working quite well. Yes, it was. Uh, now we are it will screw C++ up things beyond all comprehension Indian now. It doesn't work. <laughs> Clang format uh, doesn't work either. At I thought Clang format was our, working pretty uh, well. For our code formatting, it's, it's well, not. So, so there's, there's the problem you're making. I'm saying we pick one that is reasonably close to what we do now and say th the new one is canonical. We or, change. <laughs> or, or we write uh, diagnostics to, to our compiler, some warning that actually checks the formatting and warns um, if the formatting is wrong. I, I like the idea, but in a different context. Um, something that Martin mentioned in, in, in our mailing list discussions around the, the class versus struct. If we have conventions, when possible, we should be designing warnings around them so that we can enforce them. Um, but so we're, we're kind of jumping in, into the formatting stuff. So, and, and, it's, and it's a very reasonable thing to do because I think we are starting to run short of time. Um, formatting, we all like to read code that is consistent. It is easier. It really does help. But as a, as a reviewer, I shouldn't be picking apart people's formatting nits. It's a waste of time. Um, particularly things like trailing white space, good grief. It is the last thing in the world that anybody should ever care about. That is something a tool can and should do for us. I completely agree, but we need to find the resources to actually write a good Fine. tool if that we, will if, do it. If we come out of this with three things, I will, I will start f trying to find resources. Sure, that's, this is the first thing. That's what I want to do. I, I want to yeah. agree on a few things. Um, so uh, the, change log, the change log generation tool is ready. It works for C. And it's been tested with glibc, and it has been tested with Emacs. So we, we have two use cases where it, where it works, more or less. There are, there are a few quirks that you need to add for each source space because of the way they define macros and that sort of thing. Uh, but then I'm pretty sure you can get it working for like a, a bunch of repositories in, in like a month or so. Well, I, I think we try and see where, see where the, the gaps are. There's so, no reason we can't yeah, try this and say, oh, this, it's easy? Or we like to say, oh my gosh, <laughs> we do something dumb in GCC and it blows it up. But th there's nothing lost by looking at it. Right. So we, uh, I think for 231, we'll try to get it done for glibc, and then we can use the same thing for GCC. The ADA compiler already has some formatting warnings. Those can mean, say, you change, you do a global spelling fix across the source tree, and then you discover you broke the build because it caused one of these warnings because the line got too long. I've run into that myself. I, I, 
I get that, Joseph. But the, the cost of doing that once a decade yes. versus... Yes. I, want, I want the site boardings to say plus plus and say. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, one of the minor things I, that came up as I was reading this thing is, is do we want to think about changing the coding standards, particularly like line size, you know? <laughs> VT text terminals, 80 by 25 terminals are a little aged, even for me. Yep, me too. Um, and, and TAS versus spaces. Quite frankly, they make reading patches hard. Right. It's, cra it's, it's crazy that somebody has to, you know, they send, they send a patch, and because we, they use tabs, because they're supposed to, because we've told them they have to, the formatting's all messed up when I read yeah. the patch. That's just and, dumb. Well, and another thing is I was discussing with Segra today is oftentimes if you add blank lines, it will think that the patch has ended. And so I was replacing a function, and I found it easier just to delete the whole thing and put it in a different place in the file so that you wouldn't see the, the differences between the patch. I've done the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, to come back to the, forming, the formatting problem. Um, while I, this is what I would like to see, I'm not, saying, I'm not gonna stand here and say, we have to do this. But I do want us to start thinking about what do we do to make everybody's life easier? And so if we start really small and saying, you know what, trailing white space, let's, let's deal with that. Is it nibbling on the edges? Yes. But we prove we can do it, then we can, we can go to something bigger. So even if claim format can't handle all of our stuff for us. <laughs> all right, done. <laughs> I agree with eliminating trailing white space, but it was incredibly controversial some years back when HJ committed a patch that eliminated trailing white space. But, but even for trailing white space, we call any exceptions because in the test suite we need a few tests. So, so we, don't do the we don't do the test suite yes, directory. So, so that, that to me is a detail. Yes, so we, we, can, we can handle that. We had an option dash w trailing white space, and we compiled GCC itself with dash w error equals trailing white space. But <laughs> you don't do that in the test suite because the test suite is meant to have lots of weird and ugly styles. It, it is. I think the test suite, suite has to be to follow style. A, a, a total exception. For, for anything of that nature, it has to be a total exception. Um, I, I, I would not want to do anything like that in the test suite. But for, the, for GCC proper and for cases where we are the, the, the runtime library, I think we should do this. For things where we get a runtime from like, you know, the sanitized libraries, leave them alone. <laughs> There's no reason for us to change them for this kind of stuff. It also seems controversial in GLibc when we discuss the question, how much should we go reformatting code that for whatever reason is not in GNU style, but it's not any longer maintained outside GLibc even if it once was. Because my inclination is, yes, we should reformat that code to GNU style because that will allow automatic formatting, checking and so forth. Yep. And yeah, I agree. I, I would actually make the same decision. So yes. is the problem with Clang format that it can't do what we want to do or that we just haven't got around to writing the right plugin for it? I don't know. Martin Liska, was, I thought, was making great progress on, on building a Clang format um, mode that pretty closely matched what we did. Um, so uh, before you talked about you want to see a patch go into some type of tester before you ever see it. How is that different than the normal process of you have to bootstrap and reg test your patches? I mean, I go back to like the RA patches that you were reviewing for me, and, and I did it on both Power and Intel, trying to do a, as wide as I could. And obviously it fell out on, on some of the other smaller things. Are, are you talking about putting it into some type of uh, uh, Builder that does test across a whole bunch of things. Okay, You're damn right. <laughs> that that's thirty minutes. Is it thirty okay. minutes from now the next session? Okay, that is exactly what I want. Okay, and then how how if it does if you do if we do have something like that and it fails on some arcane architecture that the developer doesn't have access to, how do you develop? I mean, do you basically just use that tester then as your tester? That's what I'm doing okay. right now. Okay, yeah. And, so, but and how, so how it, do we get more people access to that then? That is exactly what I want to talk about in half an hour. Okay, <laughs> then I'll leave it. Can I, can I suggest we've got three minutes left. We perhaps give Jeff a go. Um, I, I think I only have one more slide, and quite frankly, the discussion is far more interesting <laughs> than, than any slide. So let me see what's on here. Uh, commit hooks, patch tester, which again, I'll talk about in, in, in more detail, and continuous testing. So instead of me walking through that, I think there was another question here, Matt? Yeah, so full disclosure, I'm Jeff's manager. But um, 
I, I just wanted to give a little perspective from the corporate side, right? This is a, this is a community meeting. I'm not going to say much. But <laughs> we are at a moment where, as was mentioned earlier, the, the average age of a GCC developer is increasing. And certainly I, as a manager, and I know others, worry about the sort of GCC event horizon where lots of people suddenly retire really quickly and we go, wait, where's our community? Um, I think we should really listen to these kind of concerns and the voices of the, the incoming students and know it's not one single thing and switching to Git will not be a panacea or not be a golden, you know, silver bullet. Um, but holistically and together, these things really matter. And so you're not going to solve it in a minute, but perhaps finding a way to have a small group who can be empowered to make some decisions and move them forwards, the way I think it probably worked on the GLBC projects, am I, am I right, Carlos? It's worth considering. All right, All right so we, we are running out of time. So who wants to be involved with this? I, I'm guessing you, Joseph. Yeah. <laughs> it's a session in half an hour is scheduled in parallel with the GLBC bot, where we expect we'll be discussing very similar things for GLBC. Probably. Um, if you want to be involved, contact me. One of the things we got to figure out is, as a project, how do we say, this is the one we're picking and going with it? Um, but if you want to be involved, contact me, law at redhat.com, and let's, let's pick two or three of these things and move on them, because what we're doing right now is crazy, all right?